The hunt for the Rotherham Rapers. I'll scream, and I'll kill you. I'd just like to know why you picked me. On the loose for 25 years, but now the net's tightening. Can you name him? Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. Tonight, the latest on the case of missing Claudia Lawrence, who disappeared in New York just 12 days ago. And we hear from the family of a father of three murdered at work in North London on Mother's Day. As usual, we are joined by some of the country's most senior detectives who hope the information that you can give them tonight will have them knocking down some doors. Also, the hunt for the gang who terrorised customers and staff at Tesco's and were stupid enough to be caught on camera. Down! Get in there! Nobody move! Just stay where you are! Stay down! Stay down! Just go! Move! And as well as this lot, I'm after the robbers who held up office workers in Horsham and nicked 200 grand's worth of computers. And a case that's been all over the news this month when David Chenery Wickens was jailed for life for killing his wife Diane, a BBC makeup artist. I've got the story behind the headlines how police caught the minister who was, in fact, a murderer. Mother's Day, just over a week ago, started off pretty quietly for the Paytac family, Mum, Dad and their children, Elif, Hussein and Kamal. But by that night, Hussein was critically ill in hospital and their father was dead. They'd been working the late shift at a local convenience store in Holloway in North London when gunmen arrived on a motorbike. I received a phone call. It was my um, brother's girlfriend, and she said, "Elif, Hussein, and your dad have been shot." And I screamed, "What?" I didn't believe it in the first time. I said, "Shot? How? You know, how did that happen?" And then, when I went there, I saw him on the floor, and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, it just was a was unreal. I kept screaming, Dad, Dad, come back, please don't, please don't leave us, Dad, please, I beg you don't leave us. I can't live without you. He didn't hear me. The police officer walked towards me and I said, how's my dad? Please, can you tell me how my dad is? And she said, I'm afraid your dad has passed away. And I screamed and threw myself on the floor. It was the worst imaginable day of my life. I had so much plans with him, you know, so much plans, but they all went down, yeah. They all went down with him. Worstest thing is gonna be for my mom. They were 30 years together and suddenly she lost him. If those people are capable of killing my dad, an innocent man, then they're capable of killing anybody. Anybody. This could be friend, this could be your dad, this could be your cousin, this could be your son that's killed. It could be anybody on the street that they could kill. And I don't think they're going to stop here. You know? Well, 
clearly a family that's just been devastated. I'm joined by DCI Carl Mehta, um, who's leading the team. Tell us exactly what happened then. Yes, last Sunday, 22nd of March, at about 10.40, uh, Ahmed and his son Hussein were in their shop when a motorcycle pulled up outside. A gunman got out and uh, ran to the shop and fired into the shop. Uh, Ahmed was hit uh, and fatally uh, injured in the, in the incident and um, Hussein was shot in the leg. And how is Hussein now? Hussein is recovering in hospital after an operation. Um, now you, you do know that these were decent, hard-working people, very straightforward, with very normal lives. What on earth could have been the motive for this Well, absolutely. Order? They were completely innocent, and I believe this is a case of mistaken identity. Um, we've got, you've got some very interesting CCTV that you've been kind enough to bring along tonight for, for people to watch for clues. Um, tell me what we're seeing, first of all, here in this. Right, this is the motorcycle travelling at quite some speed towards the scene. It's travelling along Seven Sisters Road, uh, then into Tollington Road, which is uh, at, uh, very close to where the scene is. Okay. Uh, as it pulls up onto the footway outside the shop. OK, let's take a look. We've got some stills pictures as well. Now, as you say, pull up, they pull up onto the sort of footway outside the shop. These yes. are the two men, one the driver, the other guy, the pillion passenger behind. And next, what do we see? Well, the next scene is, is when the, the pillion passenger gets off and runs towards the shop, and he fires uh, four shots into the shop with using a 9 millimeter pistol. OK, we've got, got some interesting pictures, too, that you've given us of, of the getaway, and it's significant because it's sort of a landmark street that they're going up. Tell us what we're seeing, Carl. It is indeed. Uh, the, the vehicle travels uh, along Seven Sisters Road, up towards the junction of Blackstock Road at right. so, some significant speed. It approaches the traffic lights over here, and this is particularly important because it turns red uh, as it goes through. The traffic light is red as it goes through. From there, we don't know where the vehicle has gone to. As you say, that bike going at some speed, and that bike is really significant. It, it is. It's a very rare bike. It's a Benelli TNT uh, 900cc motorcycle. Registration number is LJ04. <laughs> WLD. Very rare because there's only 112 of them in the country and only eight in London. Okay. Even if you don't know anything about motorcycles, you might notice that. Okay. If people want a really good look at that, then they can go onto the website. Very distinctive. I reckon that someone out there tonight is going to know who these killers are. Please think you saw Amit's family there. Don't have this on your conscience for the rest of your life. Pick up the phone now. The number's on the screen. 0500 600 600. Or, if you'd like to remain anonymous, that's fine. You can call the independent charity Crime Stoppers. I'll give you their number. It's 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And as I say, details of all our cases, and this one specifically, online, bbc.co.uk slash crime watch. Now here's Rav with some more criminals caught on camera. Do you remember this? It's CCTV of a man on a number 142 bus in Harrow being robbed at knife point for his iPhone. During the attack, the victim's hands were badly cut. Well, great news. As a direct result of your calls to the programme, he's been caught. His name is Terry Moss and he pleaded guilty to robbery, possession of an offensive weapon and Class A drugs. Moss will be sentenced next month. Let's hope we do just as well tonight. Thursday evening at offices in Horsham back in December and this gang are hard at work robbing the place. After tying up seven members of staff, they force one to open the stockroom and steal nearly 200 grand's worth of computer equipment. They then load up into this van before making a getaway. They may have been masked up, but staff still got a good look at one of them and came up with this. Who is he? One o'clock in the morning at Ryslip train station in West London last September and this bloke has just missed the last train home. Clearly confused, he leaves the station in search of a cab, which he later robs at gunpoint. Charming. He told the cab his name was Andy, but who is he really? Recognise the coat? Pick up the phone. Fairham Shopping Centre last September, and this elderly lady is going about her daily business. First stop, the bank. She joins the queue and then asks the cashier to withdraw 300 quid. But she's not alone. This man is watching closely. He follows her out of the bank and into Boots next door. Once inside, he makes his move. Joined by three mates, two keep lookout while the rest surround her, squirt chilli sauce in her face, then nick her purse. She's 85. How low can you get? Know them, shop them. A quiet night out at this Romanian restaurant in London back in October. 
but things are about to kick off. A fight starts up outside. The thug in the hat batters his victim, leaving him in a pool of blood and with a broken cheekbone. Lots of people saw it, but so far no one's come forward. Who are the people standing outside? And who's this? Think you know anyone? Call us here in the studio. The number's on your screen now. 0500 600 600. And if you need a second look, go online. bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. Or remember, you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space, and any message is important to leave that space or your message won't get through. Twelve days ago, Claudia Lawrence chatted on the phone to her mum before texting a friend. Then she vanished without a trace. It was so out of character for their daughter that when the 35-year-old chef failed to show up for work, her family were certain that something was badly wrong. So worried are North Yorkshire police that they have launched their biggest investigation in five years. There are currently more than 100 officers looking for Claudia with specialist search and rescue teams combing the area around her home in York. Divers from West Yorkshire's underwater search unit have also joined the hunt, scouring the city's waterways and forensic science teams are also closely examining her house for clues, but so far, nothing. Well, with me is Detective Superintendent Ray Galloway, who's heading up the investigation. Thanks for joining us with your team tonight. You reckon that Claudia has come to some harm? Claudia was a very sociable, gregarious person. She had a, a wide circle of friends. She was always on the phone. That phone contact stopped at 8.23 on Wednesday, the 18th of March. There must be a reason for that. I'm significantly concerned that she's come to harm. Now, Ray, you do have some CCTV, uh, the last sort of known movements on camera movements, as, yes. it, as it were. Tell us what we're looking at. This is Claudia arriving at York University, where she was a chef, at 6 a.m. on Wednesday the 18th, and then she's leaving at 2.30 p.m. the same afternoon. No, we, sorry, go ahead. We know that she, she gets a lift home and arrives home at about 10 to 3. OK. And, however, the last sighting that we have of her, confirmed sighting, is about 5 past 3, so 15 minutes later where she's walking back towards home. Uh, the story of Claudia has had a lot of publicity. I remember hearing it on the radio in the kitchen the, the morning that she disappeared, and, and it seemed to be the case at the time that reporters were saying that they thought probably she'd been abducted, possibly, on the way to work. That's on the 19th of March. You're now sort of expanding that area of time to what? Yes, I, I need to know where she was after about half past eight on Wednesday the 18th. The in initial perception was that she may have been abducted on the way to work. However, I must stress that an abduction is an extremely rare event, especially in somewhere like North Yorkshire. Okay. She's more likely to have gone with someone that she knows. What about the possessions that are missing then? You have some interesting key points. Claudia had a, a Samsung D900, a, a silver phone, okay. and she also had a, a carry-more, a rucksack. She carried a chef whites in this rucksack and also a mobile phone. I need to know where they are. OK, definitely need to trace those. Those could be the, the key to this entire case. Ray, thanks for all of that. Claudia is very close to her mum. It seems highly suspicious to the team that she didn't contact her on Mother's Day. We know that you're desperate to help because over 12,000 of you have joined Claudia's Facebook appeal. Please phone now if you've got any information, no matter how inconsequential you might think it is. It might just be the important piece of the jigsaw that helps. Phone now, 0500 600. 600, or you could call Crime Stoppers anonymously, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Coming up, he stalked his victims before catching them alone, closing in on the Rotherham rapist. Don't scream or I'll kill you. Stop screaming, I've got a knife and I'll kill you. Come on, we're going to a garage. We hear from the family of murdered mum of two, Sheila Anderson. The person who did this, and do you think they would remember this place and what they'd done on that day and how many lives they had destroyed? And the incredible story of how police proved David Chenry Wickens, self-proclaimed spiritualist healer and devoted husband, was in fact a consummate liar, cheat and cold-blooded murderer. Well, all that is still to come, but now we're after a gang who reckon that they can get away with armed robbery in broad daylight, but they're not quite as clever as they think. As well as leaving behind a trail of destruction, they also left police a string of clues. Fucking 
September last year, a gang broke into a garage in Staffordshire and stole four cars worth over £40,000. A Land Rover Discovery, a Subaru Impreza, a Seat Leon and a VW Golf. Over the next fortnight, three of the cars were found abandoned in Liverpool, but the Land Rover was still missing. And then in mid-November, the Mazda 5 TS2 was taken from a driveway in the Wirral. I arrived at work at six o'clock in the morning. Just a normal routine day. I was just looking at my watch, and I can remember my watch saying quarter eleven. And in my head, I was thinking, "Oh, it's nearly dinner time." seeing the security guard coming in to do the ATM machine. And I went to save another customer. Would you like some help, then? Yeah, my, my water. Uh, just to keep my water in the ground. Right, we'll take the bar for you. We were doing surveillance. We were looking to arrest a lady who we knew frequented the area. We sat in our car and just waited and watched the front of the shop. Don't see any sign of her. Mm. The woman from Tesco said she's normally here by now, so... Hang on a minute, what's that? Let's go. We ran over to the front of the shop, and that was when I realised there was something definitely wrong. Nobody move! Just stay where you are! Stay down! Just don't move! I heard the sword, thinking the security guard had fallen over and hurt himself, and I realised there was a guy on top of him. And that's when all hell broke loose. I ran to the front of the shop and just saw absolute mayhem. The two men were much larger. Certainly, I couldn't have taken them on myself. It's as if my body just took over. Somebody was being hurt, and I went to his rescue. Police! I got on the radio and shouted for assistance. I stopped because I knew it was going to hit me. Tesco's in West Jesmond. It's two men. They're both wearing balaclavas. They've made off with a lot of cash and they've knocked out the security guard. The robbers made off in the Land Rover. They travelled up Sanderson Road, left onto Osborne Road, around onto North Jesmond Avenue, and then left into Mitchell Avenue. And it was here that they exchanged vehicles, the Land Rover for the Mazda. We examined the vehicle and found it had a tax disc on it which we traced back to the Wirral. That, and the fact that the three cars were dumped in Kirby, makes me believe that this gang may have been from the Liverpool area. The gang sped off towards the city centre and then onto the A69, the road towards Carlisle. It was on that road that the now empty cash cassettes were abandoned. But we have lots of things to go on. One week before the robbery, we know that the Land Rover travelled north on the M6. It was bearing false plates, but due to intelligence, we know that it was the same vehicle. The following day, we've got the Mazda on CCTV driving outside the Tesco in Jesmond. Were the gang in a castle for a recce? If so, where did they steer? 
These are a group of organised criminals. It's not a case of if they'll strike again, it's a case of when. These men have got obviously no respect for police or certainly members of the public who are just at work doing the normal day-to-day -day things. It just makes me sick to the stomach that somebody's out there that did this. Down! And public security got through this. Nobody move! He could have been killed. It's very scary for all those people caught up in that. I'm joined by DCI Jimmy Hetherington, who's heading up the inquiry. Thanks for joining us, Jimmy. Um, the first thing we should say is, thankfully, the security guard is fully recovered now. He's absolutely fine. But, but these guys came thoroughly tooled up for a bit of violence, didn't they? There's absolutely no doubt. I mean, one's uh, got himself a bar in his hand. The other's got a pickaxe handle. Uh, we've seen the violence they're prepared to use, and I'm convinced if we don't stop them, they're going to do this again. Now, Jimmy, you and your team have got some good CCTV. Let's take a look at that. Um, describe the guys to us. Well, we're looking for uh, two white males. They're both approximately six foot tall, and they're both of a heavy build. And we can see that one of them is wearing, it's a very distinctive, it's actually beige coloured. In some of the other CCTV shots it looks bright yellow, but actually it's beige and it is distinctive. Tell us why. That's absolutely right. Uh, it is a beige jacket and there's a very distinctive motif on the back that we'd like to identify. Now there's somebody else, uh, curiously, who's of interest to you, spotted outside the shop, coming and going. Let's take a look at him and tell us why you're interested. Yeah, this one was seen walking by the shop on a couple of occasions prior to the robbery and we'd very much like to locate him to eliminate him from our inquiry. OK, Jimmy, thanks very much for that. If you know who these men are or you've got any information at all, do call us 0500 600 600. Now here's Rav with some names in the frame. Right, take a look at this lot. First up is Ahmed Orled. He's wanted for attacking a man at Paddington Station in London in May. The victim was left with a broken cheekbone and permanent sight problems. Orled was arrested but failed to turn up at court and was sentenced to five and a half years in his absence. He was last seen in Sheffield but also has links to Slough and is originally from Somalia. Next is Richard Vaughan. He was charged with making, possessing and distributing indecent images of children 18 months ago. He pleaded guilty but then went on the run and hasn't been seen since. He has connections to Rotherham and West Yorkshire. At number three is this guy, Anthony Connolly. He's wanted in connection to a serious assault on a 21-year-old man in Worthing last August. During this unprovoked attack, the victim was held down and had his right ear cut off. Connolly is 31 and originally from Liverpool. He also has links to Oldham, Greater Manchester and West Sussex. There's also a £500 reward available to anyone who has information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the attack. And number four here is Elliot Wilson. He's wanted by four police forces for numerous fraud and deception offences. He was born in Manchester as Adam Coote, but changed his name by deed poll. He also uses the alias Curtis Sinclair. He's a regular in London's gay scene and is well known for flashing his cash and also has links to Birmingham and Leeds. Police are also looking for Wilson's former employee, Sam Brown, who worked with him in Liverpool three years ago. Recognise any of them? Well, phone or text now if you do. The text number is 63399. Just type crime, space, and then your message. Don't forget to leave that space or your message won't get through. And you can also check them out online, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. 25 years ago, a violent sexual predator was stalking women in Rotherham. We know he raped at least twice because two very courageous girls came forward and reported him to the police. Both were teenagers at the time. And both have tried hard to put the past behind them. But tonight, they very bravely recount what happened to them in the hope that the man who made them suffer is finally going to be caught. By the very nature of this crime, a reconstruction does include some pretty disturbing scenes. It was a tough time in South Yorkshire in 1984. As the pits closed and industry came to a grinding halt, thousands of miners went out on strike. At the same time, here in Rotherham, a serial sex offender was preying upon young women. That was 25 years ago, and that man still hasn't been caught. I was 18, um... 
I lived on my own in a flat in Rotherham. I had been out for the day with my boyfriend and his family and during the day we bought some pictures. I was just on my way home. I think it was the last bus and it stopped outside Curry's in Rotherham Town Centre. I walked from the bus stop going out of Rotherham um, and there were other people about and uh, someone did pass me and I'm sure it was a man. I walked in front of the library building towards St Anne's roundabout. Usually I'd walk round the road, round the top, but my boyfriend didn't like me doing that. Um, so I was umming and ahhing as I got to the steps as to what to do, but decided I'd go under the subway. Don't scream or I'll kill you. I've got a knife and I'll kill you. Come on, we're going to the garage. Come on. No. I love you, he bent down and picked the pictures up and gave it back to me as though you were doing me a favour, as though you were being kind to me. Another man appeared. Help me. I remember him having a grey suit on and a shirt and tie. He was taller than me uh, and quite slim. Who was the blonde haired male? He's described as being 18 to 19 years old. Perhaps he thought he was witnessing a couple's argument. Was that you? Don't try anything like that again. The attacker then dragged his victim 60 metres to a garage under Winchester Court Flats. He was quite strong. I was probably only about eight stone then, so I was quite skinny, but I, the next day my arms were really covered in bruises where he held me as he beat this we. Uh, struggled on the uh, stairway and as he dragged me across to the garages. Come on, you bitch, get down! <laughs> no, please don't! No, please don't! No. I know you live in a flat near the fire station. If you tell the police, I'll, I'll kill you. What colour pants are you wearing? I'd lost my watch. And he turned round and he said, oh, it's here, and he picked that up. There you go. And again, as though he was doing me a favour. I'm going to go now. Yeah. As soon as he disappeared out round the corner, I uh, just ran. In the following weeks, we believe the same man was seen exposing himself to several women in the area. Two weeks later, he was back. Less than a mile away, he followed another lady off the bus. It's all right. I'm just walking up the road as well. Don't worry, I'm not going to touch you. Damn right you're not. But a couple of weeks later he returned, and this time he wasn't going to give up. I'd been out with a couple of friends. I walked from the bus stop uh, up the hill to St Anne's Road and from there to Ridge Road. I'd noticed that someone was behind me. Scream. I'll kill you. He got me under the arms so I couldn't struggle. He was dragging me off the curb towards the gateway for Blenheim House. Don't scream or I'll kill you. Oh, you're hurting me! His speech appeared a little bit broken. He used foul language and called me names. My shoe, I dropped my shoe. We fetch it for me. Stay here, I'll kill you. Thought that I might have had a chance to run away down the driveway. 
I realised that I couldn't do that. It'd be too quick for me. I'd have to practically go past him, and it was pitch dark. I'm not on the pill. I don't want to get pregnant. It hit my head, slapped me a few times. Stop struggling or I'll slit your throat. You better slit it then. I've got a knife. You stop now, I won't report you. I won't tell the police. If you don't stop struggling, I'll kill you. What's the stop you doing anyway? I promise I won't kill you if you stop struggling. He said that he knew where I lived and that if I went to the police, he'd come back and kill me. He told me to stay where I was and not make any noise and then he disappeared. I wondered if he was actually hiding somewhere to see what I'd do. So I stayed still for a while. I got up and went out onto Ridge Road. I managed to stop a car. I started to get really angry and there was no question in my mind that I was going to go straight to the police. We are sure that the man we are after committed both of these horrific rapes but he may have attacked other women who have never come forward. Think about this description. Five foot six, medium to stocky build, dark hair, protruding eyes. He would now be in his early 40s. He may well be thinking after 25 years he'll never be caught. Let's prove him wrong. I've had a string of broken relationships. I had an unhappy time in my 20s, and I put it down to this. I'd just like to know who he is and why he did it, why he picked me. Try and live with it for all these years. And he's just carried on as though nothing happened. Well, with me is criminal psychologist Donna Youngs, who profiles sex offenders evening. Uh, Donna, let's take a look at the important parts of the way this man behaved. Uh, the foul language, the threats to kill, bizarrely asking them about details of the color of their underwear and so on. Is that important? Asking the victim about the colour of their underwear, as well, as well as some of the phrases that the offender uses, all have a very scripted feel to me. Right. Um, this is someone acting out something that he's watched. Um, but the fact that he seems unable, even when it no longer makes sense, to deviate from this script does suggest that this is an offender who is not particularly intelligent. OK, and um, what a... It's very strange that he picked up the lady's shoe and then he gave another the other lady her watch. I mean, sort of gentlemanly things to do, and under the circumstances, extremely odd. Um, yes, these gentlemanly acts in the context of a rape, I, I agree, do seem very strange. Um, but, you know, actually, they're giving us some strong indications as to how this individual probably appears in normal life. Right. I think he will seem uh, mild-mannered, eager to please. Really? Uh, and I don't know if this is a question you can even answer. Yeah. Will he have done it before, before these two rapes? It's likely that there will have been okay. quite a number of further incidents um, involving inappropriate sexual comments and sexual behaviours that people will have laughed off, will just not have bothered to report okay. to the police. Now, the assumption tends to be that these sorts of behaviours just cannot be by the same offender as a vicious rape. but. Particularly in this case, I think it will have been the same offender, so people really must report anything like this to the police. Really important that. Um, 25 years ago, as we know, is it likely he will have offended since? It's possible, um, but actually it's also possible that he hasn't committed any further stranger rapes. Okay. Um, this is, this is certainly, it is an individual who has a confused understanding of sexual relationships and will have been inappropriately forceful in his attempts to develop intimate relationships since then. Donna, it's always fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much for your expertise. Um, let's remind ourselves then, these were attacks in Rotherham, in the town centre there, 1984. Let's take a look at that ether again. Do you know this man? Police do have DNA, crucially, so people can very easily be eliminated. The police just need names. If you can help, do call or text us now. The numbers are right there on the screen, 0500 600 600. And if you've been a victim of crime, for help and advice, you can call the Victim Support Line, 0845 30 30 900. If you want to take a look at the reconstruction, again, it's on our website, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. Now here's Rav with the rest of his Most Wanted. I've already had some good calls in on this first lot, so keep them coming in. Right, my number five is this guy, uh, Stephen Hall. 
He's a builder based in London and he's wanted for threatening a former client and smashing up his shop window with a sledgehammer. Hall is violent and poses a serious threat to his victim. He may use other names. Next, here he is, Andrew Smith, a.k.a. Ikey. Police want to trace him following the attempted murder of Aston Boller in December 2005. During the attack, the victim received serious neck injuries. Ikey moved to Nottingham from Jamaica in 2002, but is now thought to be living in Croydon, south of London. At number seven is Kerry Mazuros, and police want to speak to him about importing drugs into the UK. Clean-shaven here in this picture, he sometimes has a full beard and a ponytail. Born in Dover, he has links to North London, but could well be hiding in mainland Europe. And finally, it's Roderick Connell, wanted in relation to six residential burglaries in London. One happened just a couple of weeks ago. He's 50 and believed to be living in north-west London, possibly in Harrow, Hillingdon, Wembley or Hammersmith. So, do you know where Mr Connell or any of the others are hiding tonight? Pick up the phone now. If you do, the number's on your screen, 0500 600 600. You can also check them out online at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. And uh, plenty of you are picking up the phone. We've had some very interesting calls on the Claudia Lawrence case. You remember that she is the 35-year-old chef from York who went missing 12 days ago. We'll give you more on that in our update tonight. Now, Crime Watch is a live programme, and last month we had a sound problem, which meant we were unable to show you our film about the murder of Sheila Anderson. It happened back in uh, 1983. You might recall Sheila's body was found in the Gypsy Bray area of Edinburgh. Her sons, only two and seven years old at the time, had to grow up without a mum. Nineteen eighty three was the year of a landslide Thatcher victory, and North Sea oil was booming. It's also the year a horrific murder took place here at Gypsy Bray in Edinburgh. It's a murder we haven't yet been able to solve. But thanks to new advances in scientific technology, we may be able to do that. But we need your help. This is Obi -Wan CB radio was popular in the early 80s, and enthusiasts would come to the Edinburgh seafront as it gave clear reception across the water to Fife. This is Trucker. Beautiful, warm, balmy evening over here. Over. Hey, Trucker, did you know that you could drive down to the front up near Grant? Over. No idea. I'm going to check it out. Over. A CB user out that spring night spotted headlights further down the coast and set off to investigate. When he arrived, there was no sign of any car, but he was about to make a gruesome discovery. The body was that of Sheila Anderson, a 27-year-old mother of two. She'd been murdered. Sheila was a very funny, intelligent, witty person who loved to write poems. She was just a loving mother, sister, daughter, and she was just one of these types that could laugh at anything. And... Oh, I've always felt robbed about my mum getting taken away from me. Uh, I would have loved to have known her better. I would have loved even more for her to still be here today. And to think about how I would be without her mum is, is a, a, a dream, you know, is, you can only dream of that and I'll never find out. And it's because of one person out there that's pretty much screwed me over. It's hard to actually pinpoint when things start to go wrong. She just fell in with the wrong crowd, I think, and got into drugs and these things escalate. It's quite difficult to comprehend that she actually was working the streets. And it's so devastating to know that she went down that road and did what she did. Sheila had been seen in the Leith area of Edinburgh earlier that evening. When she arrived at Gypsy Bray, she had sex with whoever she was with. What's not clear is what led to her being killed. Sheila was run over and dragged for a considerable distance by the car. The wheels passed over her at least once. Her killer left her dead or dying. Sheila's watch was found next to her body, stopped at 11.54 possibly the exact time of her death. 
We've re-examined evidence taken at the time of the original inquiry, and we now have the killer's full DNA profile, but we don't know his name. How somebody could do such a heinous crime to such a beautiful person in such a lovely spot, it's just beyond me. And the person who did this, do you think they would remember this place and what they'd done on that day and how many lives they had destroyed? So even though we had some problems showing you that film last month, we had some really interesting, promising calls that came in. Police, though, Matthew, still need a breakthrough. What have we got to go on so far? The key bits of information they need. First, the car, because it was badly damaged, even written off. So police want to know if someone out there, their partner came back with an odd, suspicious story about damage to the car. Okay. The link to Edinburgh, also crucial. Was he visiting? Did he work there, perhaps on the oil rigs, perhaps in construction? Because that's one of the theories, that perhaps they worked in Edinburgh but lived in England. And that would fit with where they found Sheila's handbag next to the A1, which, of course, links Scotland and England. Just briefly, sexually transmitted diseases may also play a role. Yep, 50% chance he had a sexually transmitted disease that he then gave to his partner. Now, you wouldn't forget that. Detectives want names because they have a full DNA profile, remember, because of advances in science. That's crucial. Thanks, Matthew. So, do have a think about these clues. If someone you know fits any of them, because with DNA, you should get in touch. Our numbers are on the screen. 0500 600 600, or you could text 633 Double nine. Now, here's Rav with news of some great results. First up, a result on a case we featured back in May 2007, the brutal murder of 18-year-old Javon Henry. His fight for life, his will for life, his desire to accomplish whatever he started was so unique. Yeah, um, he worked, he did free jobs. He also attended the youth club to try and balance his life, I guess, a bit. Everyone that I know who knows him has never uttered a bad word about him. The last time I saw my little boy was at the afternoon when he left the house. Um, he said he's going to get his hair done and he will be back to clean his room. But he never came back. That night, Javon went to the Lisson Green Estate in St John's Wood, North London. He was last seen on CCTV in this shot. Just ten minutes later, he was fatally stabbed through the heart and hit with a hammer by a gang. He died the following morning. He was only 18 years old. I just don't understand. I don't know why they took him away from me. Why? Well, good news. At the beginning of this month, five men were found guilty of Javon's murder. They are Mahid Abdul here, his brother Kamal, Jubid Mia here, his brother Tufajul, and Taz Udin. All five fled to Bangladesh after the attack, but were tracked down by police. They've now been sentenced to life. Also in 2007, we reconstructed the violent theft of valuable artwork, including seven Lowry paintings from a family in Manchester. Well, during the raid, the couple and their two-year-old daughter were threatened with a knife. When they were holding the knife to me and my daughter, I couldn't believe it, my little two-year-old in my arms. And there was a life at threat. I, I just was just going to pieces. I just didn't understand what was going on. Get those two! I felt like totally, totally hopeless. I wanted to help them both so much. I didn't really care about my own life. <laughs> Well, following our appeal, this man was arrested. He's 23-year-old Casey Miller. Two weeks ago, he was found guilty of robbery and sent to jail indefinitely for the public's protection. Now for a behind-the-scenes look at a case that's been in the news very recently. 
Earlier this month, David Chenery Wickens, or Reverend, as he liked to be called, was sentenced to life for murdering his wife, Diane, a very successful makeup artist here at the BBC. Detectives started with very little, but after months of painstaking work, they proved how Chenery Wickens' double life of adultery, lies and deceit finally caught up with him. Hello, sir. It's my wife. She's, she's gone missing. She said she was going to meet me, but she hasn't turned up. Can you help me? When was the last time you saw her? It was this morning in Kensington. Does she have a mobile telephone with her? Yeah. In January of last year, Diane Chenery Wickens vanished. Her disappearance was the start of a trail of guilt that would lead police back to her home and ultimately to her own husband. David Chenery and Diane Wickens met in the 90s. When they married, they took each other's names as a sign of their partnership and became the Chenery Wickens. Diane was a successful makeup artist at the BBC, working on high profile programs like Dead Ringers. Ringers. She even won an Emmy for her work. She was someone who was always thinking about you, actually. She was deeply thoughtful, could never give enough time to those that she loved. She would just make them feel special. They moved to Sussex, where they lived in a cottage on the edge of Ashdown Forest. David worked as a spiritualist minister and faith healer. He also volunteered at a steam railway nearby, even fronting a video about it. I'm the Reverend David Chenry Wickens, and I'm the society secretary at the Lavender Line. They seemed like the ideal couple, until one day, Diane just disappeared. On the 24th of January last year, David Chenry Wickens went into a central London police office to report his wife missing. It's been really great today. Chenery Wickens told police that Diane had mysteriously vanished on a day trip to London. He claimed they'd caught the train together that morning from East Grinstead Station in Sussex. In London, they'd parted company and arranged to meet later on. It really wasn't in her character to go missing in that way. There was so much going for her and she was very much connected with her family that uh, this didn't seem right. Police got hold of Diane's phone records and started analysing them. Initially, it did look like she'd caught the train to London, but then, when they looked at CCTV of the station platforms and trains, it told a very different story. <laughs> Diane was nowhere to be seen. But another figure did loom large in the footage, her husband, alone. Chenery Wickens had made the whole thing up. His account of the journey to London was a pack of lies. When we discovered that David Chenery Wickens had lied to us about the journey to London on the train, that really was the turning point in the investigation. That was the moment when a missing person inquiry became a murder investigation. He was arrested and taken in for questioning. Police started building a picture of Chenery Wickens' life. What they found was truly astonishing. David Chenery Wickens, spiritualist minister and devoted husband, was in fact a serial adulterer and a con man. I'm looking forward to it. Discovered that he had a double life, in fact, more than a double life. We uncovered a number of different affairs extramarital affairs that had been having with in excess of half a dozen women. I... Not only that, police found Chenery Wickens was also having sexual encounters with men, and he was making up outrageous stories to cover his tracks. He was telling people that his son had suffered a severe brain injury and was in hospital. I know, Chenery Wickens did have a son from a previous marriage, but the brain injury was complete fabrication. This, of course, gave David an opportunity to live and spend lots of time away from home, uh, apparently taking care of his son. It also enabled him to borrow money from some of the women that he'd met. No, he's fine, he's fine. And his account of the days leading up to Diane's disappearance all started to unravel. The investigation was really gathering momentum. When we were examining the data from Diane's phone, it became apparent that uh, some text messages had been sent to her friends. These messages have been signed, Di. Her usual way would be to sign off as Diane. 
Well, this led us to suspect that someone was impersonating her, and, and that had to be David. Everything was pointing to Chenery Wickens, but despite this now being a murder inquiry, the police had so far failed to find Diane's body and had hardly any forensic evidence. That was about to change. After searching the couple's house from top to bottom, they discovered a trinket box with a hidden compartment. The rings belonged to Diane and they were splattered with blood. When we sent the items for a forensic examination in the laboratory, it became clear that it was Diane's blood. But that obviously gave us cause to suspect that at some stage, Diane had suffered some injury. Detectives also found the day before Chenery Wickens reported his wife missing, he was captured on CCTV in Tunbridge Wells, selling off her possessions to a jeweler. Police were convinced that Diane had been murdered. They were also convinced that Chenery Wickens was the murderer. But despite extensive searches, they still hadn't found Diane's body. It was really hard. Every day, hoping that we'd hear some news, and yet, given the evidence that was mounting up and given what we'd already been told by the police and what we were beginning to suspect, it was hoping for the best but expecting the worst. Four months after she disappeared, Diane's body was finally found here, in woods quite close to a busy road, about eight miles from where she lived. And next to her, there was a clue which was to seal her husband's fate. Alongside Diane's remains, police found this pair of boots. They still had shoe trees inside, which meant that Diane couldn't have been wearing them. They must have been put there. Whoever had left her body there had to have had access to the home address and taken the boots from the address. This could only have been one person in our view. Diane's body was so badly decomposed that police couldn't tell how, where, or when she died. But by now, they were able to put together a picture of Diane's last days. We believe that on the 22nd of January, Diane was going through a phone bill and came across a couple of unfamiliar telephone numbers. She made calls to those numbers, we believe, in order to find out who they were. And of course, imagine the shock when she discovered that one of those numbers was to David Chenery Wickens mistress and another was to a gay sex chat line. We don't know exactly what happened following Diane's discovery of these telephone numbers, but clearly there was a confrontation between her and David Chenery Wickens. Uh, our belief is that following that confrontation, he flipped and he killed his wife. Then he sold her jewellery, sent texts out from her phone and pretended to take a trip to London with her. Chenery Wickens was arrested and charged. Even when he was cautioned, he remained completely calm and showed no signs of guilt. Do you understand the caution? Yes, I do. To give you an idea of just how callous and calculating he was, after he'd murdered his wife, Chenery Wickens tried to cover his tracks by leaving this message on Diane's phone. Hello, darling. It's me. Wherever you are, just please get in contact. I'm trying to tune in to you. You, you seem to be in, in a not a good place. Yes, yeah, sure. But I need, need to have some contact. I'm at home, our home, wishing you were here with me now. Please, Diane. I'm going frantic here. Please find me. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Chenery Wickens was tried for his wife's murder in January. In court, he kept changing his story and fabricated lie after lie, saying that Diane had money problems and had even manufactured her own disappearance. David defended himself by trying to defame Diane. He tried very, very hard to tarnish her reputation. Although we as a family knew what she was like, some of the things that he was saying were shocking. All we could hope for was that the jury would see through that, which they did. Four weeks ago, the jury gave their verdict. 
Chenery Wickens was unanimously found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life. He betrayed everyone he met. However, his grossest betrayal was of the woman who deserved it least, Diane. He obviously thought that he could get away with the murder of his wife by telling a web of lies, and I'm deeply satisfied that the jury were able to see through that web of lies and convict him. Matthew, so traumatic for the family to see that uh, happen to somebody that meant so much to them, and the family themselves very grateful to this detailed police investigation. They were, because there was brilliant police work in this case, right from that early breakthrough with CCTV that mm. proved that he was lying, and bingo, he was the number one suspect. Later, there was uh, clever police work using the records from the house alarm system. The day after Chenery Wickens had murdered Diane, he was still pretending she was alive and well and living in the house. Unfortunately, he'd actually gone out that night to spend the night with his mistress, turned the alarm on, now, if she was alive and well and living in the house, of course, it would have gone off. Of course. Of course, it didn't. Um, it, a very chilling character. It's a terrible old cliche, the sort of web of lies, but really it, it applies precisely to him. It was an extraordinary double life. I mean, he was sleeping with six women, with men, and he used his job as a faith healer to, to latch on, to prey on vulnerable women, women with problems, and then he would exploit them for sex and for money, and always there was lies littered through to Diane and also to all of those lovers. Strong words from the judge during sentencing. Yeah, he was scathing. He described the lies as preposterous lies. And he talked about the agonies that Chenery Wickens had put Diane's family through. And it was interesting, when he was in the witness box, he accused Diane of being promiscuous, of her having money problems, of being manipulative, being controlling. She was none of those things. He was all of those things. And in fact, he was one more thing, a cold-blooded murderer. Thank you, Matthew. Now, uh, here's Rav with what's coming in on the phones tonight. Phones will be busy tonight. We'll start with a Holloway Road murder. Remember, the completely innocent guy caught up in that. Fair few calls, still not more, though. Interesting sightings of the bike. Some on the day of the murder, some as recently as this afternoon. Still need names for the offenders caught on CCTV, though. Have a good look. And then Claudia Lawrence, missing from York. Good calls coming in, possible sightings of the rucksack, and names suggested as possible leads which have been handed to police. Well, that's all for now. All the details on tonight's cases are online, of course, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can log on right now for a live update on what's happening on these very phones around me here. It seems like it's been a pretty busy night. The lines are open until midnight tonight, and again tomorrow morning. They open at 7.30 tomorrow. Our next programme, well, that's on Thursday the 30th of April. But don't go away, of course, because we'll all be back after the news with a full update on tonight's cases. If you can help but you haven't called yet, please do it now. It could all be down to you. I'll see you at 10.35. Bye-bye. task is that you're going to be setting up a catering service. Off you go. Okay, London 2012 is our theme. First things first, I want you all to call me chef. Mark my words, there'll be complaints today. That is not a chicken wrap. And I think the theme hasn't worked. You're fired. The boardroom battle continues. The Apprentice, Wednesday at 9 on BBC One. At 10 o'clock, the BBC News now on BBC One with Fiona Bruce and Riz Latif. Tonight at 10, the growing row over MPs' expenses. Now, of course